Excellent. Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, Building a Childcare System in Saskatchewan, Pathways and Pitfalls in Policy Implementation. My name is Jen Budney and I am a research associate at the Canadian Centre for the Study of Cooperatives and I'm very, very pleased to be moderating today's event. Today's lecture is organized by the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy. JSGS, so as what we call it, is a national hub for advanced study and research in pol public policy administration. We are a partnership between the University of Regina and the University of Saskatchewan that was based on the spirit of cooperation and collaboration that defines Saskatchewan. Since our inception in 2007, we have swiftly become one of Canada's leading policy schools for educating graduate students and public servants interested in and devoted to advancing public value. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that while today's event is taking place online, JSGS's physical homes are located on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territories. The original lands of the Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, and the traditional homeland of the Métis. In addition to these territories, one of today's speakers is also joining us from Ottawa, which is built on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. So we are very glad to welcome those of you joining us today from across Turtle Island and make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on or are visiting. Today's discussion will focus on the Canada Saskatchewan Canada wide early learning and childcare agreement and the potential challenges around policy implementation. To help our event run smoothly, we ask that all attendees stay muted and turn off their video during the presentation portion of our event. Feel free to turn your videos back on for the questions and answers session at the end. The format for today's event is as follows. Each of our presenters will present for approximately 10 minutes each. Following this, I have a few questions that I'll pose to our panelists to continue the conversation. And this will give you, our audience, time to come up with questions for our panelists as following this, we'll open it up to audience Q&A. If you want to ask a question to our panelists, please use the Zoom's chat function to send your question to me, Jen Budney, and I will read out your question. Feel free to submit questions at any time during today's event. You don't need to wait till the end. If you have any logistical questions during today's event, please don't hesitate to send a message to Karen Jaster LaForge via Zoom's chat, or you can email her at jsgs dot events at uregina.ca. You can find Karen's information in the chat. She's already been messaging you all. Please note that as with all of our public lectures, this presentation is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the JSGS website at a later date. So now that all of the logistics are out of the way, I am very pleased to introduce to you today's speakers in the order that they will be presenting. Morna Ballantyne is the Executive Director of Child Care Now, Canada's National Child Care Advocacy Organization. She has served on Canada's Task Force on Women in the Economy and on the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development's Expert Panel on Early Learning and Child Care Research and Data. Following Morna, Vani Francis is the Director of Children's Programs and Initiatives for the Federation of Sovereign Indian Nations, FSIN, this is a position she's held for the past 17 years. Vani is from Nikani First Nation, which is in Southwest Saskatchewan in the beautiful Cypress Hills. Colleen Christofferson Cote has been working in community social economic development for over 20 years in both urban and rural communities across Saskatchewan. She specializes in building intersectoral, multi-jurisdictional collaboratives using collective impact and unconventional models of governance and leadership. And last today is Haijen Mo, a professor at the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy at the University of Saskatchewan. She is an economist by training and her primary research areas include government budget management, fiscal federalism and healthcare financing and expenditure. So, I am very pleased to turn over the floor to our first presenter, Morna Ballantyne. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan. It's uh, just a delight to be here and part of this session. I want to acknowledge at the start that I'm joining you from the unceded, unsurrendered territory 
of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. It's, uh, it's really hard to believe that it was less than a year ago when Canada's first woman federal finance minister, Christopher Freeland, announced in her first budget that the federal government had a plan to build a Canada-wide system of early learning and childcare. She said the plan would drive economic growth, that it would finally put in place a secure bridge for women in particular to join the paid or stay in the paid labor force, and that it would also give every child access to high quality early childhood education and care. She said in her budget speech that the system would be transformative. She said, and I quote her, a transformative project on a scale with the work of previous generations who built a public school system and public health care. So childcare like public education and health care falls in provincial jurisdiction. Now, how would the federal government go about making this promised transformation? Well, very simply by using its spending power. The 2021 federal budget allocated $30 billion for early learning and childcare over five years, starting in 2021. And that this would this 30 billion would be over and above the financial commitments that had been made in the federal government's 2017 budget. Um, the 2021 budget also committed to ongoing funding of a minimum, and I stress minimum, of $9.2 billion a year after 25-26. At least 2.5 billion of this new $30 billion of funds would be earmarked to support the 2018 Indigenous Early Learning and Child Care Framework, which had been developed by three national Indigenous governmental organizations representing Canada's Métis, First Nations, and Inuit peoples. Some of the funds of this 30 billion, some would be allocated to supporting a new federal Early Learning and Child Care Secretariat and a new National Advisory Council on Early Learning and Child Care that would be put in place to advise the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development. But the bulk of the money would take the form of transfer payments to every province and territory that would agree to be part of the new Canada-wide system of early learning and child care. The federal budget set out the parameters for this system. It said that it would be community-based and primarily not-for-profit. It would significantly lower parent fees for licensed programs. Uh, parent fees would be reduced on average by 50% by the end of 2022, and then down to an average of $10 a day by March 31st, 2026. It would make quality licensed childcare available to all who want it. And to get there, the federal government proposed to expand significantly the number of licensed spaces. And it would be high quality, those who work in childcare would be finally properly valued and qualified. Federal budget also recognized the importance of collecting data, measuring progress, and being accountable to the public, to stakeholders, and to legislatures. So immediately after the budget was adopted, the federal government reached out to provinces and territories and negotiations began. And as we probably all know, the first agreement was reached with the province of British Columbia, and that was on July 8th. The other agreements started, were announced incredibly quickly in quick succession. The Canada-Saskatchewan agreement was signed on August 13th, 2021. And now, as of today, agreements are in place with every government except Ontario, although we are expecting Ontario to sign an agreement before the end of the month, so that was next week. The agreement with Saskatchewan gives the provinces $1.1 billion of new federal funds over the next five years. And those funds are being directed to mostly, mostly four areas. The first is affordability. The second is accessibility. The third is quality. And the fourth is inclusion. Um, and in the agreements, there's some specific targets that were agreed to with respect to fee reduction. There's the in line with the federal budget, a commitment to reduce the average out-of-pocket fees by 50% by the end of 2022 and down to $10 a day by on average by 2526. And with respect to expansion, there's a commitment to add 28,000 new licensed spaces over the next five years. 
So what advocates were looking for in these various agreements and funding arrangements between the government of Canada in each province or territory and in the implementation of the agreements is evidence of the transformational change in early learning and childcare that we were being demanding for decades and that Minister Freeland promised in her budget. So currently in Saskatchewan, early learning and childcare is not funded or organized as a public service. I'm sure I, I recognize many people on the call. I know you know a lot of this, but I think it's important to state. There is no statutory right to early childhood education and care, nor, is there, nor are there statutory obligations on the part of the government to make childcare universally accessible. Saskatchewan, like all other jurisdictions in Canada, has legislation and regulations that govern childcare. It has mechanisms to license program and over, programs and oversee compliance. But there's no law that says the government has to ensure that childcare is actually in place where it is needed. And there's no law that it requires the government to make it accessible or affordable. So as a result, what we have in Saskatchewan is a crisis of supply. The supply is uneven, it's precarious, it leaves a lot of children out, especially infants, indigenous children and children with special needs. It leaves a lot of communities without, especially in rural areas, but not only in rural areas. The 2019 Early Childhood Education and Care in Canada report produced by the Child Care Resource and Research Centre says there are enough regulated centre spaces in Saskatchewan for only 16.6% of children from birth to five, and enough regulated centre and family child care spaces for only 9% of children zero to 12. This puts Saskatchewan at the bottom of the list of provinces and territories with respect to availability. So essentially the Saskatchewan government, like all other governments in Canada, have depended on the childcare market for supply. The childcare that exists is there because individuals or not-for-profit organizations have decided to put it in place, not the government. The market approach to childcare also means that parent fees are set by providers, resulting in considerable variation, even in the same community. And of course, the price is beyond the means of most. The Saskatchewan has a publicly funded fee subsidy program that gives some relief to parents who qualify and who find regulated childcare. But these subsidies cover only a portion, not the entire of the parent fee charged. Public funding is also given to operators to cover some of their operational costs. And in fact, Saskatchewan's operational funding is among the most generous in the country. But the level of funding is still insufficient even when combined with parent fee revenue to provide proper compensation to staff who are almost all women, nor is it sufficient to provide fully inclusive programming or other important contributors to quality. Because of the very poor pay, we have a staff recruitment and retention crisis. It's difficult to get anybody to work in childcare. It's especially difficult to find and keep early childhood educators who are qualified. When childcare advocates call for transformational system change, we want child care to be taken off the market. We want the new Canada-wide early learning and childcare system to be publicly funded and managed, just the way public education is. We want governments to take responsibility in for, for ensuring that there is a sufficient supply of high quality programs. We want a system that's responsive to the needs of children first, but also to the needs of parents, particularly mothers. And we want it to meet the needs of Indigenous families and to be culturally safe for Indigenous children. We want governments to see and to treat childcare as an essential public infrastructure, piece of infrastructure. And we want childcare infrastructure to be connected to all the other pieces of provincial social and physical infrastructure, like social and income supports, like housing, like public education and schools, municipalities and municipal services. So bringing about this kind of transformation of course is not easy. It requires new thinking, it requires new government policies, new approaches, especially to engagement and accountability. So in an attempt to detail what new thinking, new approach, new policy could be, four organizations came together several months ago to develop a roadmap to a quality system of early learning and childcare. These four lead organizations worked first of all with the famous James B. 
Beach, who's on this call, I noticed. Thanks, Jane. And also, um, we engaged in, so it was uh, Canadian Child Care Federation, Child Care Now, Saskatchewan Early Childhood Ed Association, and the Mutart Foundation. And of course, we consulted with a fairly diverse group of community-based organizations and policy experts. So I don't have the time to go through this roadmap in detail. I hope it was sent to you in advance or will be sent to you, or a link can be put in the chat so you can take a look at it when you have more time. It's many pages long, but it's full of really good stuff. But I want to share instead a very complicated slide that I put together, which um, stresses or gives a picture of the elements that we think are essential to system change. And these elements apply to Saskatchewan as they apply to systems across the country. So for us, transformational change would first of all, and most importantly mean, as I said before, that it, child care would be organized and funded as a universal accessible public service. So that means sufficient public funding and public management of supply. We also say that there needs to be change in three key areas in the area of quality, affordability, and access. But the change on those, in those three areas, areas has to be made in, in coordination and simultaneously. If we only work on one leg of the stool, we end up creating an imbalance and the whole thing can topple over. And imbalance can be by making one leg much longer or not increasing the length of others quickly enough and so forth. So the three uh, stools are access, affordability, quality, those three elements. By quality, we think the focus needs to be on working conditions, on ensuring programs are inclusive, that they, take, that they are in quality facilities. Um, and of course, there are a number of other factors and these are all uh, expanded on in the road map connected to quality. Um, access means creating a lot more spaces. And that requires governments actually putting in place uh, systems for expansion through, and that means stra strategies, expansion strategies, and those require planning. And that's especially needed if we want significant expansion in not-for-profit and public sectors. And affordability means having a government set parent fee with a low maximum in a sliding fee scale below the maximum so that it is truly affordable. So we know that $10, an average of $10 a day has been set as a target across the country. That could be the low maximum or it could be less than $10 a day. But we also know that even $10 a day childcare is unaffordable for many, many families who are being left out now. Um, to be able to address working conditions, to be able to support expansion, we need workforce strategies. The other key elements are meaningful public stakeholder parent engagement, meaningful public stakeholder and parent engagement in policy decisions, both in the building and development of the system and ongoing, uh, for ongoing accountability purposes. The system needs to be based on evidence-based policies, needs to depend on research data and regular evaluation. And of course, it has to be accountable. So we just take that slide off for now. I want to just say that in Saskatchewan, the agreement and the follow-through from the agreement um, touches on a number of aspects that I've, that I've raised in connection with these three legs of the stool, affordability, expansion, and also quality. But one of the things that's clear is that the government does not yet have this comprehensive plan in place. And it's also clear that they haven't engaged in significant, uh, uh, engaged significantly with public or stakeholders in developing. So what we've seen since the signing of the agreement is a number of media releases that have announced different aspects at different time, not showing how the two are connected. So we've seen fairly soon after the agreement, there was an announcement that parent fees would be reduced. And there was some explanation of the calculation of the, the reduction. And in fact, uh, those families who have access to regulated uh, programs have seen their fees reduce, although the, the burden of trying to calculate the 
fee reductions was left to the providers, once again, to the market to figure out, not, not so much the government. We've also seen different announcements with respect to expansion, specifically two separate releases, one for about 600 new spaces, one for about 1,800 new spaces, uh, sorry, for a total of 18, the other was for 1,200, so for a total of 1,800 new spaces and a list of where those spaces will be, but we have no sense of how it was determined that those communities would get the spaces. And largely it was, the government is continuing to rely on providers to create those spaces. Um, so we don't, we don't see evidence yet of actually an expansion strategy. We've also seen some measures with respect to workforce. Just yesterday, an announcement was made that providers would get a grant of $145 per regulated space to assist in the recruiting and retaining of qualified early childhood educators. And this money apparently can be used for advertising to give bonuses uh, to staff. That is not a workforce strategy. That's, you know, these are important measures. They will help, but they are not a strategy. Um, and then the other area is around work uh, increases in compensation. Again, we had the announcement of a wage top up. That is not a strategy, comprehensive strategy for improving the full compensation package in the long term for the workforce. Again, really welcome. Any wage increase is welcome, but what we're looking for is more holistic, comprehensive strategies to actually build a universal system that is accessible to all, that is inclusive of all, and um, that is affordable. So that's the, I hope I didn't go too far, Jen, over my time. And I think I'm passing it now on to Vani. Yeah, I'll just, while Vani's turning on her mic, I'll just say thank you for that. And, and um, no, you didn't, you didn't go too far. That was excellent. Thanks, Morna. Hi there, everyone. Good afternoon, I'm Bonnie Francis. I am the Director of Children's Programs and Initiatives here at the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations. Um, I just, um, my, my presentation is just gonna be about our program. Um, I guess I'll start off by saying that um, the uh, Canada-wide, uh, uh, Canada-wide childcare program, um, it kind of, um, I guess we never had any discussions really in regards to, to um, the Canada-wide Canada um, uh, initiative with um, the provincial government because it really, um, it really focuses more on the, the province, whereas uh, us on reserve, it's, uh, we're under federal jurisdiction, so. Um, we haven't had any discussions, like I said. So um, we've been um, we had an introductory meeting with the the um, Ministry of Education, but no discussions whatsoever in regards to the the Canada Wild Childcare Canada Wide Childcare Initiative. So I'm just going to do a presentation on our program here in Saskatchewan. Uh, just a little bit of history. Uh, back in 1995, um, the uh, Child Care Initiative was established nationally, and it was to provide services to children under the age of six years old. Uh, the program provided um, uh, qualities, and they wanted quality programs compar comparable to that of the Main Street mainstream society with addressing uh, needs and barriers in First Nations communities, focusing on new spaces where services were provided and unaccessible. So some of the things that uh, happened over the years um, uh, in our early learning and childcare programs and focusing more on the childcare programs, there has been no increases in the finicky funding since 1995 to our programs. So our programs have been operating 
on the same budget since 1995, no increases, no uh, extra uh, child care spaces like, um, you know, in the province and nationally every year, uh, like especially in Saskatchewan here, we took notice that there was more uh, spaces that were being given to the province for child care seats, whereas um, on reserve, we remained the same. Um, under the same amount of funding, uh, we were given 6000 per seat. And since 1995, which uh, we had to cover, um, the funding had to cover wages, uh, education materials, uh, training. Um, there was no funding for children with diverse needs. So the funding barely covered any of the related uh, daycare costs in the communities. Um, you know, uh, one of the big issues was uh, training and getting our First Nations ECEs, um, level one, level two, level three in our communities because of the cost of sending our, our, um, our childcare uh, workers to get uh, trained. Um, because of the limited budget, insufficient funding. Um, another thing, uh, when our programs were started back in 1995, uh, we were not given capital and we were not uh, given um, facilities, nice new facilities to run our programs. Our programs had to be um, started or they were given they had to look for a space for their, their childcare programs. So they um, started their programs in basements and uh, old facilities, um, any facilities that were not being used in, in First Nation communities. So um, some of the communities, like I personally look after uh, 20, 20, 26 sites in Saskatchewan. Uh, 16 of them being uh, daycare facilities. So uh, some of my communities, uh, their facilities are in 40 year old buildings because of not uh, being given capital for uh, new facilities or even um, with a limited amount of funding for uh, renovations or even to build new facilities. Um, I think in Saskatchewan over the years, I think the last five program that was um, that was given to our that was um, an option for our First Nation programs was for our First Nation to come up with half of the funding, and the um, HRDC uh, would uh, would I guess would match for a new facility. So um, like I said, there was um, like over the years, I think we managed like 70, 74 First Nations have uh, childcare facilities. And I would say maybe, maybe 25% of them have upgraded facilities, maybe um, 10 have new facilities out of the 74 in Saskatchewan. So um, I know with the new funding that became available in 2018, the, the new ELCC funding that was committed over the, the next 10 years by the federal government, um, we've been finally able to get more resources in our communities and some of the communities are using that new funding to build facilities and you know, our, our facilities, our programs are finally catching up to where off-reserve um, facilities and um, childcare facilities, where they've been for years. Like we've um, been left behind in First Nation communities in regards to our childcare. We've been making do all these years with the funding that we've been getting in our First Nations uh, in regards to um, um, capital, infrastructure, 
training, um, resources. Uh, finally, finally, after all these years, we're finally catching up to everyone. Um, part of uh, um, our program, we have a First Nations Early Child Care Childhood Circle Working Group. And um, out of that group there, we have representatives from each of the tribal councils across Saskatchewan. So we meet, well, with this COVID, we've been meeting every, um, just about every month for the last uh, two years uh, since COVID uh, um, has been in our, our communities and across Canada and I guess across the world. Um, so one of the things that our working group does and has been doing over the, since 1997, since we were mandated by the Chiefs and Assembly, uh, some of the things that we've been able to do is uh, we've developed our own uh, Saskatchewan First Nation policy and regulations, uh, curriculum, training, um, governance and monitoring procedures. Uh, let's see, what else have we developed? Um, oh, we do mentorship, uh, mentorship programs. So... We've been doing all that since 1997 um, on our own. We've been able to do that, even though we didn't have any funding um, to do all these um, extra things for our communities. Um, and I guess, um, you know, we've, uh, over the years, there's been a lot of successes and challenges in our communities. And one of them is being able to provide all these extra um, uh, initiatives for our First Nation programs, right? So um, I don't know. Um, yeah. And that's our programs. Uh, that's our First Nation programs. And because, you know, children, that's our main that, that is what our First Nation early learning and child care programs are about. They're about our children and our communities. And I know it's really hard to keep uh, ECE workers uh, because of the amount of funding that we get in our community. So we can't pay our ECE uh, um, workers in our communities um, top dollar. And what I've been finding is when we do get our um, our workers trained and get them their EC, EC level one, level two, they leave our First Nations and they, they move to off-reserve programs because they're paid more off-reserve than they are in our communities. So um, retain and retention, that's a big problem in our communities. Um, what I see and what I find and it's a social issue, right? Um, because um, because of the amount of funding or the amount that people get paid in First Nations, it's a lot lower than mainstream um, society. So um, when they get jobs in our communities because of the lack of funding and insufficient funding, we're not allowed to, we're not able to pay our ECE workers that top dollar. So that's why they, we train them and they move into uh, the cities or off reserve and uh, we get them trained and they move on because we can't compete with um, off reserve um, uh, facilities and what they pay their, their um, people. But um, we're saying that now with uh, all the new funding that's coming to the region, uh, our First Nations uh, Child Care Circle, our working group, we developed a, uh, um, a wage grid. So um, we're hoping that um, it has been distributed to all the communities in Saskatchewan. And... Um, Hopefully some of the uh, communities uh, leadership are initiating that in their communities so we can keep our certified workers in our communities. Um, let's see what else. Um, yeah, I didn't do a, um, 
write down a big uh, <laughs> spiel that I was going to read out. I'm just um, going off the top of my head. I'm just, I want to be honest with you. This is my first panel I'm on. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm just talking about what I know, what's going on with our, uh, oh, sorry, what's going on with our um, programs in Saskatchewan in regards to the child care. Um, in regards to the Canada-wide uh, child care initiative that's happening. Um, like I said, we haven't had any discussions with, um, we just had an initial meeting with the Ministry of Education in regards to the, uh, the initiative. We haven't had discussions. So um, I'm thinking that's uh, forthcoming. So other than that, um, that's our program. Thank you so much, Bonnie. That was uh, really important for us to all hear. And uh, I know there'll be questions afterwards. I'm, I'm gonna pass it over to Colleen now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks, Bonnie. Um, and so I'm also grateful to be here. Um, so I'm Colleen christopherson Cote. I have an independent consulting firm and I work in human service policy and practice, mostly around um, poverty, homelessness, uh, and sort of income inequity. And so when Jen asked me to talk, I thought it would be good to sort of pull up uh, as a high level uh, vantage point and really sort of focus on the relationship between um, how childcare is interwoven in the poverty landscape and um, talk really specifically about uh, the lower income um, uh, brackets that we see. And most of my, I'm going to show a couple of slides. Most of my data will be specifically about Saskatoon because that's where I work. And also for all the data geeks, because I suspect there's a fair amount of data geeks on this call, the data is pre-COVID data and we're in the process of um, doing some recalculations. And so just keep that in mind as well. But I'm going to share my screen and I'm also going to, um, um, put some expectations on uh, your internal bias and the things that we bring as leaders, um, particularly as colonial leaders, but even um, depending on where you come from and how you're situated in the space that you work in, all the things that are your internal normals that you bring to the table when we start talking about policy development and system development. And so uh, thinking about the things that Morna brought into light around this concept of system, we know we have a universal access point system for health, and we know we have a universal access point system for education. What does it look like to have that for early years? Now, there's a caveat here. We know that it's universal access. That's not that it's barrier free. We also know that there is a ton of barriers inside those systems, but generally speaking, we know that where to go if we're sick and that system will then either redirect us or, or provide us the service where we, where we show up. We also know that those systems claim to treat people equally, but in practice, many of many, many groups face, I would say, purposeful exclusion over the course of the last handful of 150 years of, of colonial um, policy, policy development. And so if we're really going to start talking about creating a transformative system change, like what was addressed at the federal government, then we have to have equity-based lens applied to this, and we have to ensure that when we start talking about policy development and the practical implementation of that policy, that it's anti-racist, it's anti-oppressive, and it's culturally inclusive. And not just that, that inclusive word doesn't mean, hey, come into our colonial framework and participate in our framework. It actually requires us to disrupt and dismantle those frameworks and re-envision what it could look like moving forward. And that kind of transformative change is hard. Uh, and takes a lot of bravery, it's expensive, but it actually needs to happen. And so we, under, we have to understand too that equity, when I talk about that word, that it's actually about the fact that not everybody needs all the same things at all the same time. And in fact, some families may need something at some time and 20 minutes later, they don't need that thing anymore. They need more or they need less and that is actually okay. And so the system needs to be built so that the policy can be responsive to those actual needs. And so what I really thought we would do, and I, I, I think when we talk about low income, a lot of folks don't have a really like firm understanding around what we're talking about. So I wanted to share um, 
a shout out to the community foundation who just released their vital signs report. So if you, I'll drop that in the chat if you wanna take a look at it for Saskatoon. But if we wanna talk about poverty, we need to talk about Canada's official poverty line. So the market basket measure. And so this is about Saskatoon's market basket measure. So this is a basket of goods that I need in Saskatoon to live what I would say above the poverty line. Now, I would argue that living wage is a better indicator and I know Chuck is on this line. I saw Chuck Plant show up. I said, oh, Chuck is here. So if there's any MBM related things or any real data things, Chuck, will, I'm gonna have to sort of pick Chuck's brain while we go on. But when we look at market basket measure, we see the baskets of goods. And I think people can get their head around the idea that a family of four, this is the standard nuclear family, pretty heteronormative. Um, two adults and two kids, but noting the two kids in this market basket measure are not childcare aged children. It was purposefully made so that these children are actually in K-12. And so you won't see childcare in here, although I know I can hear Chuck yelling at me that it is kind of buried in there, but it's buried in the other costs. And so it's not actually in the market basket measure, the cost of childcare, interestingly enough. And so that means that on average in Saskatoon to live above the poverty line, you need about just shy of $40,000 a year for a family of four to live. Now, if you think about low income earners and you think about people on income assistance and you think about folks who are making minimum wage, they're nowhere near these numbers, right? And so I think if you think about the baskets of goods and you think about shelter being an important thing and food being an important thing and transportation being an important thing, clothing and other things, all being very important and that all of those, all of your income and your assets need to provide space for you to have that much money. How do you afford childcare when it's not in an, in an affordable um, dollar range like what is currently happening? So we also look at income sources from a variety of different places. And so it's really quite interesting to think about, I'm, I'm starting work around um, advocacy for a guaranteed basic income. And so we put the CERB benefit on there because a lot of people coming sort of pivoting out of the pandemic had the CERB benefit and saw that someone made a decision that everybody who was needed CERB needed $2,000 a month to get access. So this is an idea of what it would cost you as an individual earner, so one income earner, um, and so if you were on income assistance, you can see it's like $1,185. There's some caveats in there and it's quite a complicated conversation, but this is the number that we're gonna use. Um, it excludes additional working hours. Then there's the market basket measure, which is the second bar. And so that's the poverty line. And then there's the CERB, which is like an idea of a guaranteed basic income. And then there's minimum wage, which is right now in Saskatchewan, $11.81 and so if you're a single income earner on minimum wage, the red line that we're achieved, that I would say we're trying to achieve is the living wage, which is well above the poverty line, but is also a basket of goods that includes childcare and includes other things that we strive towards. That is about vibrant, um, um, inclusive, community-driven living. And so it's also not that much money. If you think about your own income, and so a single earner and living wage is about $2,500 a month. So if you're making $2,500 a month, you're living above the market basket measure. So you're not living in poverty, but you're actually not living a lavish lifestyle by any stretch of the imagination. Certainly when you start paying uh, for the baskets of goods like, like housing, et cetera, et cetera, and job. You can also look at it, this, this is a double income earner. So what does it look like when you have two earners? Still, you see people, well below minimum wage earners, well below what I would say is the living wage. So if two, two earners in your family are making minimum wage, which generally speaking are um, the folks who are already marginalized, facing vulnerabilities, quite often uh, excluded from other systems or are included in systems like justice or, or uh, health or newcomer populations, they're often, in, and in Indigenous families, are often in these sort of lower paying positions. And also you could add childcare. Uh oh, that was my timer because I knew I would go over time. You would add childcare workers to that list of folks, right? How many childcare workers, ECEs, are living in that just barely above minimum wage earning? And so how then do you afford the basket of goods? How do you create a situation where everyone is paying, making enough money to be above the poverty line, and I would argue at or above the living wage. And so then those systems of equity 
while yes, there needs to be clear universal access points that are easy to find, you can't just build a system that doesn't recognize the diversity of its clients, particularly the diversity of the clients that are below the living wage or below the market basket measure. And what does it look like then when you create policy implementation that says, hey, we're going to practically implement this. And how do you do it on a scale? So $10 a day childcare is lovely. It'd be great for me. I would have loved that. But if you're a mom with three or four kids under the age of six, $10 a day childcare is not affordable. And so it needs to account for those, those differences in diversity. And it needs to understand that once you start messing around with this number, it also ripples out into other jurisdictions and other policies. And so while we're going to talk about childcare, it impacts K-12, it impacts health, it impacts um, social services. And so there has to be a multi-jurisdictional interconnected response to the way that we implement this design and then implement and evaluate the policy. And then so, and I'm still a firm advocate that yes, this is about economy and yes, this is about getting women or, or people, I would, I would get away from the heteronormative of, of women back in the workforce and just talk about families working, but the childcare system, the equity-based childcare system we're building has to have the child at the center. It can't be done for any other reason. Thank you, Colleen. We will turn it over to Haijen now. Justin, uh, I, uh, it's a pleasure to talk uh, at this panel about child care. I start to pay attention to child care uh, during the pandemic uh, as a working mom, uh, as everybody else. You, you start to feel uh, the impossible task of balancing work and, and uh, family care duties. So the pandemic made this uh, uh, the, the caregiving issue crystal clear. A woman, our parent, cannot do both well if there's no enough public uh, and social support. So uh, the, the, pan the previous panelists are already talked about uh, um, from a variety of angles of uh, childcare. I will focus on the economic side of childcare and, uh, and, a little, and a touch upon the policy um, recommendation based on that uh, e economics, um, you know, my, my own opinion. It, the first, you know, my, my, uh, when I talk about economics, first of all, it's about family economics. This is a kind of follow up of, uh, on Colin's comment that uh, uh, one type of care solution probably doesn't fit everybody, every family. The families have different situation, different contact, uh, different uh, wage rate and, uh, and the social contact, context, different culture and values. So the, for the fam from the family's perspective, uh, child care is kind of like a, a, a service, right? Like what Mona said, there's, it's a, so far we rely on private market to provide such a service. The assumption behind it is that child care is a family duty. It's a service that you can buy, you can rely on private market. So, so if, if we treat child care as a private service, a private market service, then the, for the family, the trade-off, as we, we all know, is between labor income and, uh, and the child care. If you, you cannot do both at the same time, so the opportunity cost of working is child care. Mm. So that's the starting point when government start to think about child care. The bit, if, how much do you want to invest in a national child care program? The minimum is those foregone uh, labor income and their tax revenue, right? For the, that, that's cost to the economy. So, Providing national child care actually can save money from that perspective. But whether a national child care can really encourage labor participation from uh, parents, particularly women, that's a different issue because child care is not only about money, right? So we, as a parent and, uh, and as a parents, we all know uh, we care about uh, money, but we, uh, we, we care about the uh, the well-being of children even more. If, if the national child care cannot provide a high quality service, okay, if it doesn't help the children to develop their uh, abilities, uh, including cognitive and social development, then that child care is not what the family really want or desire. Mm -hmm. So that, that comes to the question of uh, whenever we have such a program, have to think about it's a, it's a quality is a problem uh, at, at least as equally important as, uh, as the subsidy. So the $10, so far $10 daycare is the focus, but uh, I would say 
in, in the longer term, if you really want to influence the family uh, decision, quality uh, is, uh, is also very important. Mm -hmm. Another issue is about the uh, coordination of uh, time. So childcare essentially is about time, right? So if, uh, the, if we have a childcare program, but we cannot coordinate uh, the, the schedule between school, care, and work, then this childcare program will still doesn't work for a family. But uh, I saw in the in the uh, roadmap paper uh, a report developed by Jim, uh, Mrs. Jim Beach, they, they talk about uh, in school uh, care centers. So that 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 kind of program is is an excellent idea. We need some someone to coordinate between uh, us when you know the children activity move from school to care, and also for the work part. Parents need to have a flexible working hour. Uh, after the pandemic, lots of women quit. During the pandemic, after the pandemic, only about a, you know, a small percentage of women, uh, actually a high percentage of women didn't go back to work. I just saw a report today. Because of the result of the care duty, caregiving duty is not uh, returned to the pre-pandemic level. I think another reason is the family realized care, probably the value of care, uh, they start to appreciate really the value of care, child care, or in-person kind of care. So I don't think a ch national child care really should push all the women to the workplace to participate in the labor market. It should allow women to make their own choice. You know, either they want to stay at home, or um, or or, or, or have a national daycare kind of program to, to help. So that comes to calling the question about equity, inclusion, diversity, those type of. Uh, uh, culturally appropriate um, support. So, so this this has implication on the design policy. You know, universal or not, uh, what kind of package of childcare support we should provide? Hmm. So, this is a, a, a one of the. This is from family economics a, a perspective. Another another nature of childcare. Childcare is a is a service. Uh, which we can purchase from private market, but the childcare is, is very special. Childcare is also an investment in human capital, right? It's not just a consumption; it's an investment. In the also because of the pandemic, we you know we all realize labor shortage probably is the most important constraint on our future economic growth. Every country, particularly in developed country, are grappling with the labor shortage problem. So. Uh, most countries are encouraged women to give birth to more children, you know, and the uh, and, uh, child care program is one of such a policy. So when, you know, like, like Mona said, federal government put on their website, this is an economic issue as much as a social issue. And they claim this uh, national child care program will increase GDP by 1.2%. Uh, so how, how, so it, it, this is the data about addressing supply side. Uh, issue of our economy about you know providing more encouraging more labor. Um, however, we should not uh, forget this uh, the, the 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 investment itself is made on children, and the children is the most valuable asset for our society. They are the future labor, future taxpayers, and uh, so there is some uh, research which uh, was published in two thousand ten uh, twenty. Uh, a topic of the journal. They calculate the uh, called a marginal value of public funds. Basically, is the payoff from every dollar the government put into uh, any public program, but including cash transfer, tax reduction, direct spending. So they found the one programs, the program with the highest payoff per dollar of investment is the investment in low income children's health and education. So this is probably uh, echoed what Colin found. So the 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 payoff is from the what's called so, yeah, in economic jargon it's called a physical externality. So if children got a proper education and uh, you know early uh, um, uh, care, then the the payoff would be a higher lifelong income, better social and development, and a higher tax payment in the future, and a higher you know, they will they won't use government transfers. So you take all of those benefits together, you will realize the the the, pay, the children's the any dollar we put in early child education will easily get paid back by those children in the future. 
and actually it's more than five times that payoff. But uh, in contrast, if you spend this money, same amount of money on adults, the payoff sometimes even lower than a dollar. So one dollar gets lower because this, you know, uh, payment on dollar on uh, um, adults can discourage discourage adults from working, but on the children's side, it actually increases children's labor productivity mm. in, the, in a lifelong. So from that perspective, if we really give a national child care program or such similar program uh, a value, the value is a, the is a huge. So the, in terms of bump or back, this is a huge. It's a, it's a one of the best investments we can make. Uh, we can make. So from this perspective, should, how should we look at childcare in terms of policy? It's a family duty. It's about family values only, or it's about a social investment. It's a social responsibility. So answering this question can then direct our you know, policy uh, recommendation. Should we have a, provide a universal uh, childcare program, like what Mona said, uh, kind of following a universal healthcare, universal public education, or should we, you know, find a balance between these two, uh, which uh, allow the families, which you know, to make their own choice? I would, uh, from my perspective, I mean, this only my personal opinion doesn't represent, which doesn't represent anybody or any organization. I think we should offer a package of a service, not only a universal. Uh, kind of public provision subsidized healthcare, uh, child daycare, and uh, we we, sh we also need to provide other support for families who would like to stay at home. You know, for parents who also still have the children, if they have have three children, like what the colleague said, probably it makes sense for them to stay at home. And we also need a, a workplace policy to which really respect the family caregiving. Uh, Jin had have the interest in care economy, right? We are in a care economy. We are increasingly in a care economy. Not only child care, we have long-term care for seniors in the future. So how, how can a workplace, a labor policy to respect family caregiving duty of individuals or families? I think that's a, another uh, policy direction we should look at because uh, we, it, we have to be holistic. If you look at only, you think it's child care solve all the problem, I think this is a, a wrong assumption. We have to think about what family really need. How do they co coordinate? You know, manage all those duties as a productive labor to the society, uh, a, a good citizen, but also a good parent, a good family member. I will stop here. Didn't hope I didn't over uh, run over time. That was great. Thank you, Hai Jen. Um, well, I want to thank you all, Morna, Colleen, Vonnie, and Hai Jen, for your presentations. Um, there's a lot, uh, a lot to to chew on here. Um, we do have quite a few questions coming in already, and I, I just want to start with a, a really quick question, hopefully that has a quick answer, which is, do we know the average salary for a, an early childhood educator in Saskatchewan right now, if it makes sense to talk about averages? Anyone have any data on that, Colleen, maybe? Or anyone else on this call, for that matter, because I think some people might know better. My guess, it, my guess would be that it is not much, it, it is somewhere a bit below or a fraction above the market ba basket measure for poverty. And this is one of our issues is that it's, um, it is uh, the child, the, the fees for, for child care workers are very low. Any, anyone wanna take that up? You can, you, can, you can send me a response if you do have an answer to that. Oh, it's approximately $16 an hour. So if somebody can calculate that into uh, an annual salary to get give uh, other folks a sense of what that, that means, that's, that's, uh, that's not much. Um, so related to that, you know, what I'm hearing is in terms of investment, it's kind of like we're, we're we, um, we're not thinking about investment in childcare in the right way. And even perhaps as we are implementing this policy, this agreement, we're not thinking about investment in, in the policy implementation in the right way. And it seems to me that it really starts with the training uh, and salaries for uh, ECE workers. And um, what we're hearing uh, from Vani about the flight of, of uh, trained ECE workers from reserves to off nation, um, where they can get better wages. And it's telling you a lot when they're getting better wages in the cities because our wages in the cities are very low. 
um, that's that's uh, that not only not only um, is it a disgrace that First Nations are are training folks that then come into the mainstream system, so they're subsidizing us in that sense. Um, it's just a disgrace that that wages are so so low in this sector. Um, but I've, I've also been reading recently, there was a story in the Globe and Mail about how the pandemic, the experiences of the pandemic have actually driven out already a lot of um, ECE workers from the system. So just as we're trying to implement uh, uh, perhaps what might be a universal childcare system, we're losing many of the workers that we need when we actually need more. So I'm wondering if somebody from the panel might might address this more now, perhaps you, you've been reading about this a lot lately too, or anyone have any ideas about how do we how do we get more workers and how do we how do we how do we do this well i i wish i could be really specific in my response um but one of the things we have to do is change the working conditions uh in the sector so that they are attractive and so that will mean making big upward adjust adjustments with respect to wages but it will also mean looking at a range of uh, other forms of compensation, including pension and, and benefit plans. But we also have to push governments to put in place policies and, and mechanisms to ensure that the policies are followed with respect to more favorable uh, conditions for early learning and childcare. Um, so those could take many different forms, but in, you know, a lot of a lot of when you talk to ECEs about this, and you look at what is available for teachers in the public education, you see, think about paid preparation time. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, getting paid for every hour worked would be revolutionary in uh, in early learning and childcare. Um, but the other is is that we need a strategy at a much higher level, provincially and also I would say federally. Um, because what we're experiencing in terms of shortages of qualified staff in, uh, in childcare really um, are very similar to the labor shortages in other parts of the care sector, long-term care, uh, the lower paid uh, care, uh, care jobs in the hospital sector, so healthcare more broadly, but also in social services. These are all... This is a feminized workforce. Um, and so if you address work shortages in one, it could impact, make the work shortages in some other sector. So, um, and, and of course that's gonna mean some short-term and long-term solutions, including access uh, to post-secondary education programs. But I guess the main point is that one thing can't be done in isolation from another. And what I'm seeing from the Saskatchewan government in these media releases that keep coming out is it seems very fragmented. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just gave a short example. I saw a media release on the website that the Saskatchewan government is setting aside, I think, more than $4 million uh, to you know, address broader problems around shortages or helping and uh, sort of helping people bridge into the workplace. And childcare is one of the one of the sectors that's mentioned as part of that strategy. Well, is that now going to be part of the system building strategy for childcare? Or is that initiative completely separate and apart from it? So those are just some initial initial thoughts. Thank you, Morna. Um, another good question that's just come in is is as we as we start to build this system, what's the best way to measure efficiency and equity of the universal of universal childcare? I don't see quality in there, but I'd like to see quality as well. But we, we might have a better system for measuring quality already that's not, that's not necessarily being used. What about equity? How would you measure that? I'll, I'll, I'll sp speak a little bit about what I know is that we're actually not collecting very good data or any real data at all in the system. There's, there's um, and I mean, Canada has a data problem. Maybe Vince Hopkins is on here and he can tell me why. But, um, but uh, that we are not collecting a lot of information about um, uh, parents who need childcare, uh, uh, even collecting a lot of data on the quality of our existing child licensed childcare centers. Um, there's just a shortage of data uh, overall. So I think actually a real plan for gathering data and for um, measuring um, 
accessibility, equity, quality, all of those things um, is, is needed. And I don't know if anyone here wants to speak to that as well. It doesn't have to be a panelist if somebody else. Hi, Jen. Yeah, it's funny because I ask us, always ask the students, my students to measure efficiency and equity. So probably right, your students. <laughs> so the uh, so in terms of efficiency of uh, uh, for example, a national child care program, we, we, we you know when we of looking at it is look at whether the child care program really meets the family needs, you know, it's a so-called social welfare, it's, you know, wh whether it's what the family wants. And whether they get the services they need, that they really want, you know, in terms of quality, um, uh, and and uh, and the cost of benefit, uh, which you know, the money they spend, what does it get? So that's a uh, not show about efficiency. But uh, here I want to emphasize efficiency and equity are not exactly separable. So in terms of what family want, you know, there's already different type of family want different type of things. So you have to look at uh, really which type of uh, policy really help a particular type of family. Another about the equity, you know, if we want to look at the equity of, uh, if I have a kind of a universal type of child care, if the supply side issue, so availability of a child care space is solved, uh, you know, uh, not, not like the, then, then the equity is about uh, the access point, right? Whether you have a equal treat, uniform treatment, just like our healthcare, look at a universal healthcare system. We need a universal treatment uh, at the point of access for childcare, so nobody can be rejected. Uh, if uh, it, um, they need childcare and they qualify for childcare, but this is not exactly the case based on Quebec's uh, Quebec's uh, example. Quebec had already implement, implemented such a type of system. There's a long waiting time, as far as I know. And uh, there is uh, some equity concern in terms of uh, access to the government subsidized care space. Mm -hmm. There, some people get in, some cannot. So there, there is not. So at the, at least at the beginning, when there's a supply side constraint, um, there could be inequality. I think in in terms of access, but in a longer term, if we if really um, we solve this imbalance, so uh, equity. I'm at this access point, which we can solve. But in terms of equity, in terms of outcome, I think that's a bigger issue. Even though every all the children get access to the same daycare, the outcome in terms of their uh, academic, social, and other development could be different, right? Because uh, because education is it's a co-production between um, government programs, market, and the family. Family still plays the dominant role in child, a, a child's development. Mm. Uh, no matter how, how, how much support, you know, how much policy intervention, don't, we, we cannot forget the social economic status of family will all be important mm. in terms of determ in determine the outcome. Mm. Thank so. you. Uh, Morna. Yeah, I just, I just was remarking, I was, I, th I think it's, to, to the point of the need for sort of systematic collection of data in the chat, everybody has a different view of what the average wages are for early, and you know, it depends on who you're looking at, it depends, you know, and so forth. So one of the things we, and by the way, the agreements do have a long list of, um, of indicators that uh, have, that both levels of government have agreed to where, you know, data will be collected and presumably an assessment will be made. So data collection, of course, is one issue. The analysis of the data is the other. And then what are we measuring it against? You know, what, what, what is actually what we want to achieve? And all of this has to be figured out. And I, I think it's really important that um, this kind of discussion involve not just government officials, um, that they really have this whole, this is, this is what I mean about a complicated approach. It really has to be a collaborative approach and it has to go well beyond the government. There has to be active engagement with the sector and those outside of the sector. Like, you know, Colleen's raising some really important issues with respect to equity. Uh, so if this is a, if this, which it is, is a massive project, you know, first new program since Medicare uh, and a Canada wide scale, 
we have an opportunity to build it well. Um, but it's only going to happen if it really is what I call a democratic project. Um, where it's done so that all the data that's collected is shared, that uh, research questions are shared, that others have a contribute, have an opportunity to look at what governments are using to make policy decisions to, so that we can determine collectively whether or not the policy decisions are evidence-based and are actually going to meet all the needs, the variety of needs, and the equity really has to be at the center of it. What is the point? of building a program uh, in 2022 that's actually not going to make a dramatic difference uh, with respect to, to equity. Thank you. Um, so speaking of which, uh, there's a, a question for, for Vani, um, and then I'm gonna tack on my own question for that as well. And so one of our one of our guests here, Vani, was wondering if if FSIN drew any lessons from uh, from the province in terms of um, where is the uh, the question here in terms of designing um, designing your programs and and what I'm interested in is that as we know the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action number twelve called upon all levels of government to um, work towards developing culturally appropriate um, child care for Indigenous children. And I'm wondering um, also, Vani and, and maybe Colleen, you've got some perspectives on this as well. What kinds of conversations need to happen between the province and let's say FSIN, maybe Métis Nation, Saskatchewan as well, in order for this to happen? And what are the obligations of the provincial system to, to ensuring that there's culturally appropriate uh, child care available for Indigenous children who are off living off reserve. Okay, so um, I guess in regards to FSIN, um, um, you know, we haven't had any discussions at all with the province in regards to the child care program. Uh, like I said, uh, we did meet once and it was just a and then an initial meeting just kind of introducing ourselves and we were supposed to have um, continuous meetings but uh, we haven't we haven't had any discussion with the province whatsoever um, in regards to culture culturally appropriate programs um, because we have them in all of our programs on our first nations in both the the child care and the head start because I work in both programs um, and I know um, just hearing from uh, one of my colleagues who works um, both with on reserve and off reserve programs, she said that there is hardly any cultural programs are, that are being um, implemented into um, off reserve programs. So that's needed for sure. That's needed like um, uh, language and culture, uh, elders that need to be brought into the programs because uh, from what I hear, there is a lot of uh, uh, First Nation children that are in um, off reserve programs. So um, it would be nice to get some of the culturally relevant program and programs into uh, the child care off reserve uh, programs. So yeah, that's, um, it would be nice. Um, I'm hoping that when we do finally meet with uh, the ministry that some of those talks um, or some of our, um, some of the things that we do in our programs could be implemented into off reserve programs. And I know, um, I don't know if I mentioned this when I, when I did my presentation, but I do have a working group and it consists of around 15 people. And some of them uh, individuals have been in the program since um, 1995. So they have a lot of history. Uh, they know what's needed in the programs. And like I said, some of them have lived off reserve and have worked in off reserve programs and they see that there is no um, cultural 
culturally relevant programs that are being um, introduced or even uh, implemented into off reserve programming. That needs to happen. Thank you, Vani. Mm -hmm. Did you oh, want me to? Stop? Yeah, go ahead. So this would also speak a little bit to the idea around how we measure equitable access in a childcare system. So often we talk about overrepresentation of certain demographics and certain systems. So there's an overrepresentation of Indigenous people living in poverty. There's an overrepresentation of Indigenous people in corrections. What we don't often talk about is sort of the flip side. What is, where's is the underrepresentation happening? And there is an underrepresentation and a purposeful exclusion over 150 colonial years of purposely excluding Indigenous people from the economy, purposely excluding them from education policy and outcomes associated with K-12. Um, and so if we're gonna start talking about equitable system implementation, we need to start talking about why there's over-representations in certain systems and under-representation of the same demographics and flip side systems and how those systems are woven together so that we actually start building capacity that we don't see over-representation in what we would say is sort of a, a, a not great system. Like I would say corrections is not a great place where people want to land. Uh, and so we start to see those numbers drop because we'll start to see education outcomes increase, et cetera, et cetera. But what we, what we don't really talk about is um, the conflict between jurisdictions, uh, federal, provincial, municipal, indigenous governments. And often when we talk about government, we leave indigenous government off the table completely. We don't even mention them, but they play a fundamental piece and a fundamental role in the connection between the relationship between community, municipal government, provincial government and federal government policy. And so until Bonnie's right, like it's appalling to me that the provincial government or the federal government hasn't talked to FSIN in this province around the interconnectedness of a provincial childcare system and what's currently happening within the indigenous communities. And so we like how moving forward, we build a collective system. It's not about inclusion in a colonial system. It's about the fundamental disruption and dismantling of the current, well, it's not even a system. We talked about it being well, some kind of weird patchwork, right? Mm -hmm. How do you disrupt and dismantle it and build something that's, real, that's new? Yeah, um, Morna makes a, the good point is that one of the questions advocates haven't been able to answer is how the Canada-wide system of early learning and childcare intersects with the Indigenous early learning and childcare framework. And I think in the absence of systems and the framework for uh, childcare on reserve also sounds like a patchwork um, that they are making do um, with, with uh, not enough resources to actually create a, 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 a real system. Um, and so, you know, how do you get, how do you get two, two, uh, two sets of patchworks to talk? <laughs> You know, it's pretty, it's pretty hard to figure out where the intersections are when they aren't even systems yet. So, so it seems like there's um, a, a lot of work to do there. And, and this is, is, I mean, it's important all over, uh, all over Canada, but in a province like Saskatchewan, um, where, you know, Indigenous children are the future of our province, um, this is even more important here, I would say. Um, Can I just say something? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, um, uh, we just had a meeting, um, was that yesterday? Yesterday, yeah, with the uh, Assembly of First Nations. Um, I sit on a national uh, early learning and child care working group. So we all met uh, yesterday to discuss the, the um, input that we had into uh, the, the, the Canada wide, wide uh, child care initiative. And it's not only in Saskatchewan that we have not had input with the government. It's across Canada. They have not um, um, invited or have not had discussions with any First Nations across, across Canada in regards to this uh, Canada-wide uh, child care initiative. So it's across Canada. Mm -hmm. And um, I know there was a survey that they did and they wanted input from each one of the regions, right? In regards to what we thought should be implemented in the, in the Canada-wide uh, initiative. And um, we met with AFN and um, I think it was all agreed that, uh, you know, we need to have input into this uh, 
um, this uh, new initiative uh, for childcare. And we've kind of been left out with no input whatsoever. And, you know, who knows, you know, you know, they had the, the four principles um, and some of the uh, other regions said, well, those aren't our principles in our region, you know, so we need to uh, sit down with the, with the government and we, we need to have input because, um, you know, they're using our, our numbers in each region, right? Our early learning and childcare numbers zero to six in the whole population uh, for the funding formulas, right? So uh, we need input on that. So that's our thoughts. That's, uh, that was our, our national working group's thoughts um, that we need to have more input into um, this Canada-wide um, initiative and also my working group break where we probably hopefully um, soon will be meeting with uh, the ministry again uh, to sit down and discuss with them. Thank you. Um, uh, so we, we're getting close to the end here. I'll ask one more question from the chat. Uh, we've heard about the importance of equity, especially for low-income families. BC has had an affordable childcare benefit for a few years. Are there any lessons learned? Maybe this is for Morna. Maybe Hygen has been studying this too. Um, I think the affordable childcare benefit in BC, I'm, I'm actually, the names of these different initiatives change and I, I lose track of them. Is, is what's being referred to the initiative to bring down fees? I mean, there are a number I'm, I'm of different- a, it, it might be, yeah. Yeah, I mean, each a lot of jurisdictions have various programs to bring down fees, or actually more programs to subsidize uh, parent fees to not actually bring down fees. What what we advocate for is that fees be brought down. I guess you could say at source. That you know, it's 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 it has to be a simple system. I think Colleen was really making that point effectively. Uh, one that is understandable. And so what we want is set fees and we want the cost of the fees, the low fees uh, to be paid for through increased operational funding. Right now, like in Saskatchewan, what they did is they did that in a sense and they, they to, to finance the 50% reduction, um, there was a, you know, fee grants, fee reduction grants provided to, to the operators, but that's replacing existing revenue loss from parent fees, which is inadequate to actually pay for a truly inclusive program and a truly, you know, a, 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 as I said, to pay, including to raise compensation. So what we need, when we say we want a fully publicly funded system, we mean that the entire thing should be paid through public funding. Then a, a policy decision could be made is should those who access the system who use the system be charged something and you know which essentially is a user fee let's let's not kid ourselves a parent fee is a user fee um, some public services have user fees others don't others are actually legally prohibited um, like medicare but um you, you know so then you say okay so if they have to pay what is the most equitable way to figure out what the fee should be how the fee should be collected and there are all kinds of options to that. There could be no fee at all. There could be a very small uh, charge that is uh, recouped through the tax system, which, you know, if it was done well in a progressive way, would ensure really good access, right? Uh, but of course, access is not just about fees. It's also about availability of programs. So again, that's why you need a publicly funded and publicly managed system. The whole thing has to be turned around. We have to think of it. I mean, Colleen's right. I think it's a massive, when you think massively about how we actually develop a system that's not a colonial system, my mind starts to explode because I don't think we really know how to do that. But um, we can at least make a start. And I want to be clear. I'm not saying that the progress that has been made in the initiatives, this $30 billion, this is good. This is good because it's putting into motion the opportunity and the potential for big system change. 
It's up to us. It has always been up to people to make sure that public systems are, you know, meet their needs are designed properly. And it takes organization. So I just before I know we're running out of time, I want to make a quick pitch. Please, if you care about helping to build a really high quality, universal, inclusive, affordable, good program for everybody, get involved in child care advocacy, get involved in child care now, Saskatchewan, easy to do, no cost involved if you can't afford it or anything. Um, work with others and in whatever way you can, because it is, after all, a public program, and that means we own it and we should shape it. Thank you, Morna. Um, Colleen, we've got one minute left if you want to say something real quick and then I have to start to wrap it up. Um, sure, I'll be super quick. I'll tell you right now that I am not an advocate for prove that you're poor to get access to service. Mm. And so if that's the system that we want to build where someone has to go in and say, here are my T4s or here are my things and I, this is how I get access to funding, that's not what I want. And so what I'm worried about is when we talk about subsidy, it's prove you're poor. And prove your poor policy actually is really ineffective. And if we're talking about equity and anti-racist, anti-oppressive policy, it's actually extremely deeply rooted in personal bias and racism and colonial histories. And it needs to, it needs to not happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is the system we have in place right now in Saskatchewan. I can tell you as a former board chair of a very large childcare center in the core neighborhoods of Saskatoon, it doesn't work. Yeah. Um, so, so that is it, folks. Um, we are ending the near of our, uh, nearing the end of our time together, and uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank today's speakers, Morna Ballantyne, Bonnie Francis, Colleen Christopherson Cote, and Haijen Mo for their all of their insights, their observations, and all of the lessons we've learned here today. I think we could keep talking about this for another four hours or so, um, but we we do have to wrap it up. Um, if you enjoyed this lecture, please keep an eye on the JSGS events calendar where upcoming events are being promoted, including the power of stories, narratives and information framing effects in food science communication, a CSIP forum featuring JSGS's Dr. Yang Yang on March 24th, uh, learning from the pandemic challenges and opportunities for child for Canada's healthcare system will be presented as part of the, the house and lecture series by Dr. Catherine Smart on March 30th. And if you are interested in learning more about JSGS's programs, please join us on March 29th at a program information session about our Masters of Public Administration program and on April 1st to learn about the Masters in Health Administration. Karen is going to post links to these events, which I think she already is, and the JSGS events calendar in the chat. So please join me now for a round of applause, um, uh, audible or otherwise. For our speakers, you can use Zoom's reaction option. Um, and thank you for joining us today. I, uh, I'm so pleased at the great turnout and for all of the questions. Sorry, I couldn't get to all of them. Have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>